check the mic and make sure it sound right, boy. So welcome everyone to the group chat brought to you by Overmark. Today we have a special guest with us. And without further ado, I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, my name is Leon. I'm a rising third year student at NUS. And on the side, I have a YouTube channel where I talk about studying tips for A-levels, for O-levels, GCSC, university application tips, as well as my journey in law school, if you'd like to walk. Take a look at that. <laughs> anyway, for all our listeners out there, what we're going to be discussing today is going to be super relevant to you with the exams upcoming, you know, how is it that we can take care of our mental wellness? And I think Leon, uh, on his end, on his YouTube channel, he has talked extensively about this. And I think it's really an honor to have him here today with us in our podcast to talk about this subject. So maybe I'll start off by asking Leon, so why is mental wellness so important? Well, you see, mental wellness is kind of the fuel that gets you going. Your body is the engine, but the, the mind really is the, the soul to, to it. You, you, the mind really is the driver of, of the engine. Sometimes, I mean, me myself, I felt it, you know. Sometimes it is not that you're not free. You just simply don't feel like doing any work because you're burnt out. And it's not that you're incapable. You, you can sit down there, but things are not going in. You just simply don't feel like doing it. And sometimes you don't, you just don't feel like waking up because uh, you just get overwhelmed. And for myself, when I get overwhelmed, uh, I, I might procrastinate a bit. Uh, you know, sometimes I just don't feel like waking up and just keep pressing the snooze button. It happens to all of us. But the key thing is really how to keep it under check. And it is an extremely stressful period. I've been through it myself, the O-levels and the A-levels. Um, and there's absolutely no shame to visit a counsellor. I visited a counsellor during A-levels. Uh, and I still do time to time in university. And uh, you don't need to have a clinical issue to visit a counsellor. I think a counsellor is always happy to talk to students who are facing a difficult thing but really when you keep your mind happy and active is kind of how you can do well in a way that is sustainable so they don't burn out and they still kind of enjoy what you do so i think this is why mental wellness is important completely agree there actually i realized that one of the big reasons as to uh, why you find a lot of singaporean students unable to cope with uh, certain mental health issues is because of the stigma that's attached to it. So I really hope that uh, well, things start to change. But for now, do you think that, that, um, that schools are putting in place adequate policies to, to tackle that kind of stigma against seeking mental health? And do you have any tips for any of our students who are feeling the exam stress right now? You know, sometimes I feel like a very toxic culture that exists in Singapore is that we always just keep comparing ourselves to others, sometimes not recognizing that progress is what we should strive for instead. So yeah, I just want to get your thoughts on that. Right. Um, so you asked a couple of questions. I'll address them in turn. The first one is a policy matter. Um, I think uh, I've left uh, secondary school in JC quite some years back. I can't really comment on that. But back in my time, I feel like I definitely felt like it was a bit more taboo. I visited a counselor. Uh, I, I tell my parents and they're very worried. They say, oh, boy, are you okay? I said, I'm definitely fine, but I just need to see the counsellor. Uh, and sometimes, you know, if you have some very personal matters that you, and you're afraid of telling your school counsellors because, you know, the school counsellors, if they deem it to be something serious, they can tell our parents. Then when, what I did was that I visited a private counsellor, which costed $200 an hour. You know, it's not something that's available for everyone. So to a certain extent, it's quite taboo. I think one thing is that um, the matter of confidentiality, but it's a very difficult thing because, you know, if the student tells the counsellor something that is so grievous, you know, the, the, it's by law that the counsellor cannot keep it. It's, the counsellor has to seek help from someone. And so that is the, the confidentiality issue that uh, is quite hard to balance. I'm not proposing a solution, but that is something that I think students need to be given more assurance. At least they open up and, you know, take the first step out. So I think that's important. And I think um, also the current uh, study mindset is not really particularly an Asian thing, but I find that especially in, in Singapore and say South Korean stuff, uh, the comparison mindset is, is very real. Um, me, myself as well, um, used to compare if person X can do it, why can't I? I think at least for O-levels and A-levels, it is still decently possible to use that mindset, although it's not very good because O-levels and A-levels are really standardized testing. Uh, it's not really IQ test, I believe that. I don't think I'm the smartest of the lot, but I, I think I'm one of the more hardworking ones. I wasn't very good in uh, physics. You just keep doing the papers, you kind of get better at it. So there is that comparison there. Um, but 
take it uh, in stride and not let it overwhelm you. So I think really as what Emmanuel has touched upon is that the growth mindset. Some, I heard this saying from one of my seniors that it's okay you know, if you try your best and you don't get it. And sometimes when I try my best, I don't get certain things I want. Um, it's not really to like results. Sometimes when I'm applying for university, I applied to Cambridge. I didn't get it. I wrote, I wrote 16 drafts. I didn't even uh, get an interview from, from the college. I visited the principal of the college. Uh, I got chased out, I went back again. Um, but yeah, really, sometimes you try your best, uh, you don't get it. And, and that's okay. But really, the idea is to keep trying what, in whatever you do, be it for grades, be it for applications in life. Just keep doing it. Uh, keep the faith. Don't let the crown slip. One day, one door open for you and that one door is enough. It may not be academics, but uh, something open for you if you keep it up. Yeah, I just wanted to, to chime in here and talk about a few things. You know, the very nature of O-level and A-level, we, we understand because it's a system of meritocracy and the very fact that we are placed into a bell curve creates this, um, this, this need, right? And this, this sort of uh, structure whereby you are, pit, you are pit against your friends and your peers and you're compared uh, in terms of a normal distribution. And I think this is the system that is currently in place there's nothing that we can really change about it, even though we might want to move towards that. But at the current moment, we just have to accept that this is the reality that we live in, right? But putting that aside, I think sometimes the, the, the cruel part and what makes comparing very toxic is that sometimes you have the mentality of, in order to climb to the top, I have to step over somebody else. And sometimes that creates this very unnecessary pressure where they're always constantly in a state of comparing with others, uh, how you're doing, because mm -hmm. you're always benchmarking yourself against the rest. And I feel that that in itself creates a lot of stress, right? Because mm -hmm. right now, there are a lot of things that are out of your control, right? How mm -hmm. other people do, that's not, that's not on you. You can't control that. But what you can actually control is how much you have progressed and the growth mentality that we've been talking about, right? So if you've been constantly been making improvement from a C6, C5, B4, B3, it doesn't really matter if you didn't get that A1, all right, or that A grade at O level and A level, because according to your own standards, you have been making that progress. And I think you should take credit for that and should be proud about that. Doesn't mean your friend is getting an A1 and you're not getting it. That means you're a failure. I think that is a structure of the education system that we can't change, but it's not necessary to go down that route. And it gets very, very depressing and it leads you to set unrealistic expectations. And touching on something that Leon mentioned, right? Sometimes certain doors open in life, sometimes certain doors close on you, but you never know what this path might lead out and how life pans out, right? So going beyond your academic life, where you end up in life, you don't really know. And you can't really give a definitive whether this is better or not because there are so many different timelines, right? So doing your best is often what I always tell everyone. That is what you need to do. Just give it your best. See mm. how life pans out, right? There's no need to be so fixated that if I don't get this exact L1R5 and I don't get into this JC, my life is over. Mm -hmm. That's not true, right? Because going to another JC, going to another course, it opens up so much possibilities. And you can't really predict, you know, what's going to happen. Maybe even greater things might happen, right? So don't put yourself down because of results and stuff. The worst thing that could happen is that you let your results define you, right? As Leon has mentioned, you know, this is a, it's not really a test on IQ. This is just a standardized test, right? This is just a hurdle you have to cross in your life to get on to the next stage. So while it's important and you acknowledge that it's important, don't put so much emphasis on it as if your life depends on it because life is so much more than that. It's so mm. beautiful, you know? You go on to uni, you meet new friends. For myself, I went on an exchange before COVID. You go travel, you see the world, you know? It's not about academics. Nobody's going to ask you about O-level, L1, R5 when you meet a new traveler in, in Sweden or something. You know, nobody cares about that, right? Mm. So... Keep a broader perspective and I think it makes things so much easier for yourself in terms of your mental health. But I think throwing the time back to Leon. Now, I just wanted to get your thoughts on it on certain reasons why some students might feel very stressed out. Uh, be it like expectations or like, you know, they, they start to burn themselves out because they study too much. I just mm. wanted to get your take on why students uh, would feel a lot of stress, especially during this exam period. Mm. Yes, yes, Daryl. I think I absolutely echoed the points you mentioned above. Um, really, at one point, I kind of put my self-esteem on the grades I get, and that was exceptionally unhealthy. Um, but I can understand wh why people do that, because we, we do live in a very stressful um, society. Um, but I think, the, looking back, 
my most trying years, my A-level years, and I look at it, um, I kind of displayed quite an incredible amount of resilience to really bite the bullet and go on. And it is that attitude that I think would kind of take you far in life. And going on to the question about the reasons why students um, feel stressed, I think I can speak for myself. Um, the first one, you know, it's the unrealistic expectation. Um, I, I, I do believe that, that apart from meritocracy, some people have innate talents, um, be it by nurture or by nature. So say, for example, um, some people are just better at literature or, you know, better at English, you know, because they were brought up in an uh, English-speaking family and maybe their parents are lawyers and their parents are very educated people who can teach them the subject. Um, then again, uh, there's a nature side. Some people are just faster with numbers. I'm not very fast with uh, physics because it's very abstract for me. I struggle a lot. The amount of effort I put for physics is probably at three times more than biology, even though uh, I need to memorize a lot. And innately, I can memorize a lot. That's my capacity. And so that, what, that was my skill. So we need to be realistic with our expectation. And I think the way to go about that is that you just try your best. Um, and probably that is as far as you can go. The next one is really also about um, the, the having a good revision timetable. So sometimes we have a short spurt of uh, energy to just revise and you just kind of stop it. You need to have a very clear system to revise in a way that's sustainable. It's not like one day you revise and stop. I think you kind of got to have a new mindset to put studying into your life and not like it's just a thing that I have to do. The way that I look at studying is that it's kind of my job. Um, you, you don't necessarily love it, especially when you're not doing well in the subject because no one likes to be in a losing end. But you just do it because you have to. That's the way I look at it. It's a very pragmatic mindset. But then, you know, when you get better at it, you kind of gradually uh, hate it less and maybe even like it. So I think having a good uh, revision timetable is important. And the way you can do that is also to look at um, SEAB website, look at what is actually tested because that's the kind of the um, wrong, it can't be wrong when you look at the SEAB website because that is essentially what will be tested. Use that as a checklist. Make sure you understand every single thing that is tested there. And that is how I teach my students last time when we were doing science, um, especially like biology, chemistry. These are very, very clear checklists in SEAB. Just use that. And sometimes you need to memorize stuff, use uh, SEAB's checklist. So this is the way they can go about it. And very importantly, uh, you need to take breaks. I In my kind of studies in O levels and A levels, when I take breaks, I felt guilty because I'm not doing something productive. That was how I felt. Um, even when just going out with my friends, I felt guilty and you come back and, and work. I felt like I was never really myself because even when I was CCA playing my friends, it's always bogging uh, me that I have something to do. But then you realize, why don't you just have fun in that three hours or four hours that you have? And then when you work, you just work hard. So I think the work hard, play hard mentality should come in. And when you take breaks, it's actually justified. And I think research has shown that when you are taking break, it's actually not that you're not doing anything at all. If you're taking a long walk in, in nature and stuff, your mind is still processing. And which is why sometimes when you're stuck on a question, you come back from walk, you actually find the answer. So learning to take breaks and being easy on yourself, actually, I think it's scientifically proven to be better for productivity as well. Wow, that was... Uh... That was that was that really really hit home with me because I I think that what one of the biggest um one of the biggest stress relievers back then was always just going for a little run. I I I really resonate with how you mentioned that A levels was the most trying period of your life. So for me, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's the most trying period lah, but I would say that it was the most intense two years of my life of really hunkering down. To, yeah. Uh, yeah, to just hit the books right. But okay, I found it very therapeutic uh, towards the towards the end. <laughs> Can't say so for when um, I was jolted into the entire environment. I think that was horrendous. But yeah, I, I don't okay lah, I, I really I really see where you're coming from and I, I can't agree any anymore. I think that that's that's amazing. Yeah, anyway, uh, I also wanted to touch on uh, the kind of mindsets that um I myself uh adopted to to cope with uh the stress that comes from the competition in in the exams. So I want to share this um, with the kids who are tuning in. And uh, maybe you could share a bit of your thoughts on this, uh, Eon. So um, I subscribed very firmly to the idea and the philosophy of Stoicism. So I just mm -hmm. was talking to Daryl about this like last week. 
So I was telling uh, a lot of uh, our students who are listening in that sometimes you have to step out of the frame of uh, your life and recognize that there are certain things that you can control and certain things that you cannot. So you should only feel uh, the sense of happiness and fulfillment and peace when the decisions that you have made are the right ones. So that means that perhaps you shouldn't be too happy when you've gotten an A, but at the same time, you shouldn't be too sad when you haven't met your expectations. You should try your best to make your, uh, your peace, your joy, your happiness, your fulfillment come from the decisions that you've made. Because I think that's really the path to a happy life. And I feel that when you adopt that kind of mindset in life, it doesn't matter whether you're a student now or when you grow up to be an adult, get into your career and everything. I feel that that philosophy will really take you far. Because yeah. when you learn to isolate and, uh, and take away all the external uh, things that you cannot control, focus only on what you can, then you are really able to give yourself credit for what you have done right. And of course, at the same time, if you have uh, unfortunately made wrong decisions, then obviously you should also feel uh, the resentment to yourself, the, the remorse you know, for making those decisions. So personally, I think that stoicism is something that uh, I wish I knew a bit earlier. So when I was, I think when I was, um, when I was sitting for my O's, I didn't get what I want, what I wanted rather. And I felt very destroyed by it because I felt like, oh, I was so shortchanged by certain things. Uh, and then when I grew up a little, um, matured a little and reflected on uh, the things that happened in my life, I realized that a lot of things uh, were not actually for me to blame. And I had made a lot of choices that were right when I was just like sec four. So uh, looking back, I actually feel quite um, proud to, to have even like put in that much effort, you know, to really have made that decision to try to hunker down and study. So I, I really hope to share this, this philosophy with uh, our listeners or so to maybe go and search a little into stoicism. So I feel that that is one big step uh, to improving your mental health, especially if you're having a lot of these thoughts of uh, uh, self-esteem issues. If you're feeling like other people are much smarter than you or anything like that, realize that there are things that you can control and those should be the only things that you really keep your mind on. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on this, uh, Leon? Yeah, I'd say I echo your point. In fact, uh, just recently, I was reading this book called How to Be Sad by Helen Russell and I actually made a review of the book on YouTube. Um, in uh, her book, she mentioned about this point about arrival fallacy. And I think it's very similar to what you have said that, um, you know, you try your best for your O-levels. So that was me. I tried my best for O-levels. Yeah, I, I was the top of the cohort. And what's next? You know, it's just like when you climb Mount Everest, you thought, you know, climb Mount Everest already. That's, that's the thing. But then, you know, after you come down, you realize, actually, just, just get out of life. That's the next thing, right? So the same thing, you know, A-levels, oh, I get, you know, good scores. I go on to law school. Oh, law school is a big thing. Never thought that you could. But it doesn't just stop there. You realize after law school, which firm? What, uh, deg what degree classification? It just goes on and on. I think this point about stoicism is important to really pace yourself and not give yourself this um, rather false and quite unrealistic expectation as though if you get X, you'll definitely you know, be extremely happy. Just for, for me, I kind of had that problem as well. Um, I applied to Cambridge. I thought if I get it, it would be my whole world would be perfect. But that's not true. If I get it, you know, I will still be thinking about what firm and everything. I will still be in that competitive mindset. And I don't think that uh, my happiness would be, you know, any different from where I am now. So this arrival mindset is something that uh, we got to acknowledge it and to really address that. Oh man, stoicism. Okay, for me, I never really came across this, this theory before, this philosophy. But for me, I read this book on seven habits of highly effective people. And yeah. the one that I could relate to the most is this idea of circle of influence versus a uh, circle of concern. So there might be a lot of things you're concerned about, like how other people perform or like how the paper are set and stuff. But honestly, those things, even though if you worry about it, it doesn't change a thing. But things that are within your circle of influence are things that you can actually tangibly have an impact on. For example, if you want to do better, you spend more time on revising, uh, change up your revision schedule. Those are things that you can actually affect the outcome. And I think that really changes the way you look at the world and how you look at your own control of your own happiness. Because you need to know there are certain things that no matter how much you worry or how it concerns you, you can't change a thing, right? And those are the kind of things that you really can't worry about. Because 
if you start worrying about those things and yet you can't do anything about it, you're just making yourself unnecessarily stressed out or unhappy. So think about it. Is this something you, that you can tangibly make an impact on? If you can't change anything about it, let it go. I think letting go is something that is very underrated. Letting go of expectations, letting go of um, the stress, letting go of certain expectations you have of yourself. I think sometimes it's okay to, to take yourself as a joke, you know. Life is actually not that serious, you know. Just, just take a chill pill and relax, you know. Life is awesome, but it's just the way we construct life and how we look at it that makes things so stressful. Some of my most fond memories when I was in school, be it secondary or A-levels, uh, is really not about the result. Like, not right now, I look at my A-level result, it doesn't bring me a single bit of joy. But it's more of the journey that I've been through with my friends, the personal growth that I, I, I grew through, developing that kind of resilience and grit. Those are the kind of things that carry, that carry me forward in my life right now that I appreciate. Nothing about that grit itself. Even though I needed that grit to move on to the next phase in life, on to go onto a path that I want to go, but the grit itself means nothing. It's just like I pass this test, I pass this game level so that I can advance to the next one. So there's just going to be so many more tests in your life. And if you are really stressed out about one and then you're about to move on to A-levels, you shut up about A-levels, like Leon said, it's endless, right? So sometimes learn to enjoy the process, learn to be okay with the results, learn to accept things, learn to let go of expectations. And I think that goes a long way to make your life better and obviously to keep your mental wellness uh, in a good state. Because... Something that's very underrated is understanding that when your mental wellness is in a good state, you tend to perform better as well. So stressing yourself out is not the solution. Too much stress will break you. Sufficient amount of stress could motivate you. So you kind of need to find that balance and maintaining your mental wellness is a key to that. All right, I think we had enough talks about why is it important tips to really improve your mental wellness onto our favorite portion of the podcast, which is dilemma of the week. Right, Leon, we talked a lot about uh, importance of mental wellness and how can we keep it in check. But I think something that our students might be curious about is that if right now they're planning to sit for their national exam in less than three months, right? How many hours of revision is enough? Well, I think this question doesn't come with a very easy answer or very specific answer. Um, it really depends on how much you can afford. Um, and also really, before that, I think a few principles have to be stated. It's really the quality of time and not the quantity of time. Uh, I know some very hardworking students, they, they don't do well because really the, in the time that you're working, how, how are you trying to work is, is really very important. You know, like for some subjects, I don't really spend so much time because I was kind of naturally quite good in it. But for some subjects, I have to spend more time. And in the time that you spend, what exactly are you doing? Are you just blindly memorizing? And for like math, it's not about memorizing, it's about application. So you really got to use the time carefully. It's not the more the merrier, but really how you use it. And having said that, um, the way that I, at least when I studied, I aim for 10 hours a day, 5.5 days a week. Uh, it's quite intense. But let me explain to you how I rationalize that. Um, so when I started out, uh, so in the morning, I wake up around 8, you know, start at 9. So I start at 9, 3 hours, 3 hours paper, some A levels, O levels, around 3 hours, right? Paper done, eat lunch, paper 2, another 3 hours, so that's 6 hours. End of the day, uh, take 3 more hours, 3 to 4 hours and mark the papers yourself. I think it's very important to mark the papers yourself. You get the tutor to mark it. Fine, if it's English, fine, you know, because you can't really mark an essay. But for like math and science and say uh, uh, humanity, some of them you can really mark yourself and you should really go through the answer yourself. I think about three to four hours. And at times I might take longer to mark it if that paper was really trashy um, than that I spend the time doing the paper. So if I do it for two and a half hours, I can mark it for four hours. And But in that process of marking, it's not a waste of time. It, that process of marking is where you learn. So I think that is that. So the way I look at it is... Um, it's just like work, right? Sometimes when you, if, if you ever tried working for a part-time job and stuff, you do work about 10 hours. So the way I look at it is, it's actually work. It's just my professional work. And I take my studies quite professionally. And that's why 10 hours, five or five days a week. And the rest of the time that I'm not studying, get, get a break and like, do something fun. That's very, very, very healthy. <laughs> I completely agree. But um, I think that in my own opinion, I don't think you can quantify it based on time. So I actually told my students never use time as a gauge uh, to track your progress. So I always tell them that uh, if you really want to track whether or not you're making progress, it should be based on 
the competency. And you can only really track competency um, by calculating a percentage of the scores that you can score for a particular topic. So how I tell my students to study is actually uh, right now, they're brushing up on their topical. So um, a lot of them are already asking, is it, is it now uh, I have to instantly throw myself into doing papers after papers after papers? Then I told them, actually, you shouldn't really look too much into trying to rush papers and uh, be doing the same exact thing as what you see like the general uh, population doing. Because I feel like uh, if you're not quite there yet in terms of certain topics, it's much better for you to get rigorous practice in those. And then um, find mastery first in those topics before you approach like a holistic uh, full paper. And also personally, like, I feel that time sometimes, right? If you measure things in terms of time, you will feel very productive because <laughs> anybody can just sit there and, and slog for that uh, multiple hours. But I feel like the real proper measure, especially for math and science, okay, maybe I, I'm not too sure about uh, humanities, la, but for math and science, I feel like it's important for you to actually gauge like a percentage of the questions you feel confident in getting uh, the marks for. So for instance, if you come across a math question where it's like, say, calculus, right? Then you know that, okay, I'm, I'm most likely going to get this question correct because I've seen this multiple times. I know the, the tricks that they can ask me and uh, I know exactly how to navigate through them. Then I think you've really hit that level of competency, competency that you really need. Uh, and I think that that should be the way that you study. La. So personally for me, I, I did that for my A-levels and it really helped me get a good sensing of where I stand for every topic. So um, nobody is exactly the same. So my stra study strategies may not work the same. Leon's study strategies may not work for you as well. But you really just need to put that time in and uh, the effort in to really make sure you're getting things uh, in your way, right? So everybody has a slightly different kind of studying habit. So what do you think about the most optimal um, way in which that you can digest content for English? So I want to hear from, from you because, I mean, what, what better words and what better opinion than from a law student himself? <laughs> All right. Um, for English, it's not... If you look at the exam you tested, uh, comprehension don't you memorize, honestly. It's about understanding, like, you know, the teacher can teach you all kind of formulas, but really when it boils down to it, it's, it's not about a formula, it's not math. It's really uh, understanding what the question is asking and use common sense. I think common sense is really underrated here. When you're bogged down with all the formulas and stuff, okay, you've got to use a certain formulation to answer. Uh, these are guides and these are not uh, the, the end of the, the story. Really, it's the inference uh, and how you commonsensically understand the text that matters. Um, so go with a commonsensical approach. And memorize, I don't think you need. Maybe for GP, you know. You know why I don't memorize is that because I read the news often. It's just, it's just there. La. Maybe you memorize a bit more so that, you know, you have some things to say. But if you're an avid reader of the news, you don't have to. For O-levels, you don't need memorize. O-levels, English, even you write discussion and stuff, is quite bare bones. If you read the news once in a while, you kind of roughly know what to write. So I don't think it's very heavy a memorization. Uh, maybe just a bit. But if you do an essay every week, you don't actually have to memorize. So English is more application than memory work, I would say. So I think um, just to wrap things up a little, in terms of uh, how many hours a week, right? I just wanted to give my take on this. Um, I would say if you need a quantifiable number, I think Leon mentioned 10. Uh, for myself, I think O-levels, I did around 8 to 10. Uh, A-levels, I think I did around 12 with breaks in between. Uh, but, but that was because I was really slacking off in uh, my JC1. So I was like in a very bad state. I had to catch up for it. But 12 hours was not very productive. Like with the breaks in between, you know, and stuff. Yeah, it, it wasn't a very good cycle. In fact, I will recommend keeping it between 8 to 10. That, that, I think that is ideal. Now, the thing you want to think about is your level of confidence when you're doing a revision. I think that's the best gauge of your progress. Humans, you know, we have a tendency to want to quantify things, right? It's easier to count like one hour, two hour, three hour, but it's hard to gauge your level of confidence or your level of mastery because there isn't a quantifiable number that you can correlate it to. So, but I need you to think about this. If, for example, we, talk, we are talking about EMF paper one, right? For example, doing the 2020 paper, how confident are you that you can answer every single question? If you are super confident and you do the same for 2019, 2018, and you start doing backwards and you feel like I can gauge everything and I manage to do everything right within sufficient period of time, then you're already in a good state. You should feel good about it and you don't have to feel stressed if you're not spamming more and more practices. You can instead spend your time on other subjects that you need more time on. 
Same thing for, I'll say, humanities. If you look at the paper and it says um, Japan in World War II, right? And how confident are you of your pointers, your PEL, your conclusion? If you already know everything, you don't have to spend more time memorizing it. You just need a refresher before the exam. So rather than approaching it using a very quantifiable method, I'll prefer if you think about it. If you were to see in an exam right now, how confident are you that you will be able to ace the exam? Same thing for science, same thing for English even. Knowing, for example, if the, if the, the, the statement comes out, do you know what are your pointers that you're going to bring out? What examples you're going to bring out in your discursive essays? Uh, so on and so forth. So I think that might be the best way to do it, but that's just for myself. All right. And I think today we had uh, this super conclusive discussion on uh, mental wellness. I think there's a lot more that we would love to touch on, but we just wanted to keep this uh, sweet, short and succinct. Uh, so I'd like to thank Leon for coming on to this podcast. Really appreciate your appearance. Uh, maybe just give you a little time to shout out your YouTube channel so that more students can uh, discover your great content. Again. Yeah, um, you can just, uh, it's an eponymous YouTube channel. You can just search uh, Leon Yam. Uh, it's in the name uh, that I have there. Uh, I think uh, it won't be the top hits. Uh, yeah, so you can check it out. Uh, I do uh, productivity tips, uh, A-level, O-level, GCSE tips for uh, students as well as university application. And sometimes, even though you think that it's too early, it is kind of have a, it's a good thing to actually think about what you want to study and to give yourself the motivation. So I do this kind of content and feel free to check it out. Awesome. I'll put the link to this channel in the description, so please go and check it out. But I think with that, we've come to the end of the group chat. Um, thank you, Leon, for coming on. And Emmanuel, I'll also see you on in the next podcast. So to all our listeners out there, remember to give us a like so that more people can discover our video. If you're listening on Spotify, please remember to follow us. But if not, we'll look forward to the next podcast. Study hard, guys. Keep the dream alive. Bye, everyone. Sound right, boy. 